Welcome to the Growth League podcast, where we interview business owners who have experienced quantum leap growth in their business. In each episode, we're going to dive deep into our guests' firsthand experience about what it was like 90 days before and 90 days after that point when their business started experiencing massive growth. I am so excited. I am here with my guest, uh, very good friend, Miss Sheena, Mrs. Sheena Rogers Pfeiffer. How are you, Sheena? Thank you so much for joining. I'm great. Thanks. Awesome. Well, before we get into it, I'm going to uh, give the folks listening a brief background on you and, uh, and and pump you up a little bit here, and then we'll get right into it. So I'm very curious. <laughs> so Sheena is a seasoned strategist with very rare 360 degree experience in public, private, and nonprofit sectors in the areas of public and community relations, sales and marketing, brand strategy, and customer experience. She's an industry leader specializing in transformative business outcomes driven by people, product, and process. She's an advocate for a shift in the means and modes of marketing communications. Business relevant impact must be illustrated through human centric insights and strategy. And Sheeta embodies this both herself and with uh, the companies that she's at the head of. She founded Anstice Communications, which is a leading agency consultancy hybrid that focuses on issues management and public relations, uh, marketing, digital transformation, and research. Anstice is now one of Canada's leading strategic firms with a client portfolio spanning from local businesses to national and international clientele. Most recently, Sheena founded Ari, which I'm curious to learn a little bit more about, Sheena, um, a social commerce solution to female online shopping problems. Now, are there problems with that? Are there there problems with that? Or is that just a problem in and of itself? (laughs) All right. Sheena's amazing. When uh, when you're in the room with her, you know she's there. When she comes in, she has a, an energy and a vibrancy about her that is unmatched. She is a mother of three, uh, a, a, a boss, an entrepreneur, a, a hustler, a, a wife to one. and Just uh, one. Just one. That's a wife to one. All I can handle. That's right. Uh, and she spends her time back and forth between Vancouver and Calgary. So... Sheena, nice to have you. Thank you so much. Well, that was very nice. Thank you. Thank you so much. So the Growth League podcast, as you know, it's all about uh, digging into business growth. Uh, you know, what was happening at that time? What were some of the fears, frustrations? And then and then what were the, you know, feelings of, of you know, jubilation when you, when you broke through? What was going on? What were the things you put in place to achieve uh, sort of that hockey stick growth? So... What I want to do with you first is um, actually get you to tell us about how family life is right now. Uh, we were talking about it in the pre-show. I'm sure things are crazy. So tell us. I mean, yeah, it's just, this is unprecedented times, right? And I, I mean, honestly, I feel like my life hasn't changed all that much because when I moved to Vancouver a couple of years ago, I was sort of in this like in-between stage anyways, where I didn't really have an office full of people to go to here. I was going back and forth to Calgary. So I was working out of my home. Um, So I kind of just like continued that whole process, I guess you could say. Um, But the beginning of COVID is really challenging. Like it was for everybody. Like we had our kids at home and we were trying to juggle homeschooling while my husband, who's an executive, was trying to work while I was trying to work. And yeah, it was total fucking mayhem, right? But I mean, now I feel like we've kind of gotten into a groove and um, it's funny because I've actually, I have an office now to go to and I haven't been able to get myself into a new routine to like get up, go to the office and like get back into that sort of normal habit. So I'm kind of stuck in between. Um, But no, I'm very thankful. Like our, our family is healthy and, you know, happy. And I think that these times really... Um, it's a good time for self-reflection. It's a good time to examine like what's going on in your life and, you know, what matters and what's most Mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's all that I'm thinking of right now. It's just, yeah, yeah, I'm, my, my family is safe and healthy and I'm happy to be living in Canada. I'm happy that I have a job. Um, I'm happy that I'm able to give others jobs. Hmm. So, yeah. 
it's amazing how much gratefulness gives you that spark of energy to keep doing your other things. Hey. Um, yeah, it does. It's kind of, especially when you know that you have other mouths to feed, like yep. not just your children, but like, as you know, you've got staff and yep. you know, there's a whole other level of accountability. And so during these times it's been, yeah, like you want to make sure you're taking care of your people and, mm-hmm. and it's, and, you know, being able to, I guess, understand what they're going through and be more understanding and empathetic because everyone's all over the place right now. Like, I feel like everybody's kind of hit a new level of edge. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What I struggled with mostly was that I, you know, I was largely very, I would say I was very insensitive to everything at the beginning, at least in my own head. And luckily only in my own head, because what I realized quickly, you know, after the the crazy spring is that everyone's all over the place and, and you need to, it doesn't matter what you think about it. Um, you know, this is a, this is a community based thing that we're going through. It is. And it's kind of testing, I think people's EQ quite a bit because we all have different, we're all on different, I guess, ends of the scale as it relates to COVID, right. And how you feel about it and how your, you know, what your risk factor is or your risk threshold. Mm-hmm. And so that's the other thing when you're running a team is like, you have some people that are on totally different spectrums of that. And, you know, you have to find a way to your point about community and collaboration. Like you have Mm -hmm. to find a way to really get people on the same page, which has been super challenging. So I don't know how many times you get asked this question or, um, you know, how, when was the last time you've been asked it, but can you bring us back to the very, very, very beginning? So I'm curious and the listeners are curious about the origin story of Anstice. Um, Sure. Yeah, I mean, I'll try to keep it short and sweet, but um, essentially, I was working on the private side, on like the corporate side, and I was really frustrated with the service I was getting from agencies, and I found that there was just no strategic partner at the table. And at the same time, I was getting approached by a number of different um, people from all over Canada to help consult on some of their strategies that I was doing sort of off the side of my desk. And yeah, I just decided that I wanted to go out on my own and give it a good shot. And so I started entities from my dining room table. I had two clients to start with. Um, one who's still a dear friend of mine and uh, the other one that I actually had as a client for almost seven years. So yeah, it was just two clients, myself. Um, I hired my sister, I think very early on as an intern and yeah, we just sort of like grew it very organically. I actually kind of never set out to build a company. I just wanted to do what I love to do. Um, and that's kind of what happened. Everything sort of scaled from there. And, and what year was this? When was this? Gosh, you're going to age me, Caleb. Um, so that <laughs> so, was in 2009. 2009. Well, 12 years ago almost. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and if someone was to walk into the office now in Marta Loop, uh, what would they see? What's the, what's the, what's the team makeup? Um, what are you guys focused on from a, from a discipline standpoint? Um, tell us about Anstice right now. Yeah, we've got a very glossy pink floored office, (laughs) which I love that McKinley Burkhardt did for us. Mm -hmm. And actually my makeup of my team right now is more men than women for the first time. I used to have more women in my office, not purposefully. It's just kind of how it happened. Um, But now I'm officially outnumbered. Um, Wow. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. And our disciplines right now that we focus on is marketing strategy. We're doing a lot of like insight validation work um, with a lot of companies, risk mitigation, um, still continuing on our vertical around um, uh, crisis communications and stakeholder engagement and sort of community relations falls into that. Mm -hmm. And then we're really um, doing more and more work right now in customer experience and, um, customer journeys. So kind of fits into the marketing strategy piece. Cool. And then there's a new kid on the block, Ari. What's, uh, yes. tell us, I know it's not new, new for you, but it's new for some that may, uh, may not know. Yeah. Well, I'm kind of in stealth mode with Ari, so okay. I'm not going to say too much, okay. but I will say that, um, I've started a tech company and it's based in Vancouver 
and we are solving social commerce problems and yeah. um, specifically social shopping problems. And um, we just closed our first round of investment, which I'm wow. thrilled with. So. Congrats. Thanks. That was, oh, that's a whole other podcast, by the way. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. So I managed to get this off the ground um, during COVID and we'll wait and see. Yeah. Our, our alpha is being built now. So I'll have something to show you here in, in a few weeks. Looking forward to it. What's the, what's the inspiration behind the name? Well, my daughter's name is Ari. And basically what I'm trying to build is a more safe, supportive social shopping network for women. Um, where you can share and shop with each other instantly. Awesome. Yeah. So it's personal for me as well. Very cool. Yeah. So there is never one tipping point. There's never one moment, I don't think, for, uh, you know, when you go from the proverbial garage to the, you know, to the boardroom with, with team members and a, and a legitimate office and all these types of things. But is there one that sticks out, sticks out to you more than others in terms of when and Steve started to experience this next level growth? And can you tell us about what did the few months before that look like? What are the few months after? Look, what was the context, maybe some processes or quick wins that, that propelled it? Tell us about that. Yeah. I mean, in all honesty, I feel like we've gone through three Okay. tipping points, um, if I was to really reflect on it. And they all, and I've really, I really ha like, have thought a lot about this. There's some things that are a common thread, and then most of the time it's quite different. Um, I, seen, I think the common thread would be leadership. Like the common thread was when we were really growing, we were scaling, um, we had great leadership in the organization. Um, and when we weren't growing and scaling, I think we had the wrong butts, or the, I guess you could say the people, what's the saying? The wrong people wrong, in the wrong seats. Wrong butts, wrong seats, bus, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So um, our first sort of like big growth point was actually quite early on in the company's um, infancy. So it was around when we were about three years old or so. Mm -hmm. And we were kind of a dark horse. We kind of came into the market and we, we collected some really high profile clients and we're doing some of the best work I think that we've ever done. And then I got pregnant with my first child mm -hmm. and I had no idea like what to expect. And, you know, you don't get a mat leave. So I had my first child and being an entrepreneur with a growing business, having your first child with absolutely no co-founder, anything was like getting shot out of a cannon into like a dark, deep ocean where you don't know like where you're going to land or how you're going to swim. And so to make a long story short, we were, um, I think I look back now with, you know, still lots of pain that that was a time that really killed us, to be honest. Like I put the wrong person in a leadership position and that person completely destroyed the, the reputation of the company, completely just let things fall apart right underneath me. And um, I, I talk about it openly now after a lot of therapy. If, if you're listening, you know, if you're listening, you know who you are. Yeah, exactly. So we don't mention names anymore. Um, again, therapy. Thank you. you <laughs> no. So it was really like, no joke. It was, um, awful. It was just so disheartening. I had to like rebuild the company almost completely after that time you know, I, and it's my company, so I mm -hmm. couldn't blame it on anybody. I had to go to my clients and basically take full responsibility and accountability for what happened and, um, kind of start over. Mm -hmm. So I started over, I guess you could say at that point. And then we grew again, which, um, was probably around 2017 or so. We were kind of almost at like 25 staff. We had almost 40 clients. Like it was bustling. Right. Yeah. And, what the problem was though, is that it was busy and we had lots of clients, but you know, we're a service company. So your hourly rate is your hourly rate. And you would know this, that in a service business, it's like this magic point of like being able to grow and then take a risk to invest in your operations and hope to God that right. your client base is going to follow. So service business is very, very hard to scale and grow. Um, so we had, I think a really big growth point there, but the problem was that we had too many clients that weren't paying us enough. Mm -hmm. um, so we had too many small clients. Um, we had, you know, too many people, I think on the payroll. Um, and our model was just 
because the model, we were just sort of reacting to what the clients were demanding. And that was probably one of like the worst points for me, like the second worst point for me in NCDs where I had to really sit back and go, okay, what is this business and how do we make money and how do we model this that is actually going to work mm-hmm. where we're not having to go through this like huge roller coaster right. all the time. Um, so I made the decision to um, basically change the entire business model. I blew the agency up. Like I had to let people go. I had to let clients go. I think there's some people on my team that they still call it D-Day <laughs> <laughs> because it was just, you know, it wasn't sustainable. I was like investing all this money into the agency. We had, you know, at a, at a, on paper, we looked like we were, you know, doing so well and we were doing fine, but we weren't growing at the rate that we should have been. Mm-hmm. So I blew it up and then um, sort of rebuilt, remodeled it. Um, I really did some deep, thinking. I went to my clients. I went to other CMOs. I kind of did what we do for our clients to ourselves Mm -hmm. and got a lot of data, started to really understand like, what is the value proposition? What is the differentiator in what we do that nobody else can do? And yeah, just kind of really dug deep. Hmm. Dug deep. We kind of leaned out. We we leaned out the team, but we brought in way more senior people. Um, I really focused on like core areas that I knew um, a we could charge more for, and b would sort of put us at the C suite level. So one right. of the things that I found was really frustrating with our two of those growth scenarios is that we were always sort of like the first to get cut, or we were always the ones begging for budget. Mm-hmm. And I was, you know, with what we had to offer. Um, there was a greater opportunity for us to sit more at a strategic level within these organizations. Um, so we did that, um, just a couple of years ago now and yeah, we're, it's, it's going great. We, you know, moved into new markets. Hmm. Um, you know, our portfolio is quite diverse right now and yeah, I'm really happy with, with how things are going. Everyone thinks that growth is all, you know, butterflies and champagne, right? It's it, both of your growth stories there were on the heels of some pretty traumatic experiences. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think the fortitude it takes there and the mental toughness and the, and the, you know, the, the risk tolerance off the charts has got to be there, um, for you to do that right now. I wonder how much of it is that it's your baby, it's your thing, it's your identity that, you know, going the other way wasn't an option. Um, did you, in those moments of total chaos, did you see that it was, it was one option, one direction, or, or were you uh, torn? No, I was like, quite honestly, I think I almost gave up on the agency actually a couple of years ago. Like I, I had just had my daughter, I had miscarried right before that. And I kind of went through like a bit of a transformation. I think when mm-hmm. I, when that happened, where I really started to think about what's important and what is it that I want to be doing. And you know, I felt like I was just on this treadmill for the last decade and I was just tired. I think Mm -hmm. I was just getting burnt out. And so for me, it was a lot of a reset and surrounding myself with people that, um, and this is, this to me would be like the secret sauce is that I surrounded myself with very senior, very experienced people who I could bring into my team who could compliment me and who, if I was to take off and say, start a tech company <laughs> like I am now, they're there at the helm and I trust them and they're running things and they're, they have the autonomy to do it the way that they want to do it under the brand. And that to me has been, um, I think fundamental in us being successful. Hmm. There were so many, you know, great, exciting moments, you know, in the last 12 years, but there were some, some super dark yeah. ones for sure. What, you know, growth, I had an interesting conversation with Chris Neeland not too long ago um, from Cult and from The Gathering, and um, he had told me, and I hadn't been thinking about it too often, but it makes sense that that growth to infinity is not not what we're looking for, right? Growth, like a tree, a tree comes to its mature age at some point, right? Mm-hmm. Where is Anstice in terms of its aspirations to grow taller, or right now, are we looking at the, you know, the structure of the roots, like talk to us about the, the going forward growth trajectory or, or strategy of, of Anstice, where, where does it need to go? Yeah. I mean, I love that you said, 
I love like what you talk about as it relates to growth being so many different things. And um, I'm really thankful that I've been able to evolve and grow with Anstice because it, it, it's, it, my company is a direct reflection, I think, of like how I've been growing and evolving as a mm-hmm. person, right? And where my interests lie and, and which has been really kind of fascinating to kind of look into. Um, I don't think, you know, from a, from a strategic standpoint right now with the business, I think we've got great roots. Our roots are very stable. They're, they've always been great. Um, for us, it's more about how do we maybe make the tree a little bit more dense, so not necessarily having to um, spread our branches too far. For us, I think we're, we really just are focusing on our core offerings, doubling down on those core offerings, mm-hmm. um, and then really just um, being able to, I would say, like continuously improve the quality right. of, the output of work versus the quantity, which is something that I learned through that last piece when we were just churning at work like we were yeah. churning at with 40 clients it was like chaos right yeah. and the client that's paying you two thousand dollars a month gets the same attention that the client that pays you twenty thousand dollars a month and it just was nonsensical right yeah so doubling down i think on the things that we're really good at and you know keeping and growing our portfolio with our existing clients and through their network is sort of the strategy that we've taken on today gotcha now, is Anstice running without Sheena right now? Can it run without Sheena? Where Where are you in the in the grand scheme of things? Well, I'm happy to say, for the first time in my whole life, that Anstice is pretty much running without me. It's amazing. You know? It's not, and I wouldn't say without me. Like I'm, I'm still involved. I I love my clients. I have very close relationships with my clients. So um, I'm still involved from a strategic standpoint, more behind the scenes. Um, mm-hmm. And then, of course, I still see my senior team every week. Um, so I'm not out, yeah. but I'm definitely in a place where I feel like I'm not the bottleneck and right. that I'm not the only person that's responsible for everything. Right. And that was, that was for me, like the hardest part of being able to grow this company. Like, right. As a, you know, as a, there's real challenges. Like as a woman, I know it, it's not, you know, some people would say it's a cop out, but you know, to have a child and to be the only, like the sole CEO, founder, leader in your company, to have, that, to have to go through that three or four times in the life cycle of your company, like, of course it's going to cause impact. And looking back, if I could do one thing differently, I would have probably structured things the way they are today a lot sooner, right? Mm. And have those partners, bring in those partners, like find ways to to bring in those senior people that I could really rely on. No, it's, it's crazy. What, what you and other women like you have been able to accomplish when, when you're building a family, building a company, it's, it's insane. Like I, I was struggling and my kid barely wants to see me yet. Like, you know, it, it's incredible. It's, it's unbelievable. So, um, you actually, you alluded to my next question, which was right at that, at that moment where you were, where you were leaving client side and you were you know, curious about following the breadcrumbs towards building your own thing. Let's say you were in a cafe or something in in Calgary. If you could take for two minutes, if you could zoom back there and you have two minutes with that Sheena, however old Sheena was at that point, 14 year old Sheena, no. uh, What would you say to her in terms of, hey, I have two minutes with you, listen closely. Mm -hmm. I would say... Um, it's a good question. I would say find a great leadership team. That's what I would say. I would say, don't do this by yourself. You don't Mm -hmm. have to do this by yourself. This doesn't have to all be on your shoulders. You don't have to be the perfect mom, the perfect wife, the perfect boss, the perfect strategist, the, you don't have to be all those things at once. And, you know, you can be, 100% in one of those roles at one point, knowing that you're going to be 50%, you know, in those other roles. And the only way to do that, I think, is to first accept it. And second of all, like surround yourself with the people that can make up that extra percentage when, when you can't, Mm -hmm. I think I, I, you know, I am at a fault. I try to do too much, um, and take on too much on my own. Um, and it's, it's a lesson that, that you learn, right? Going through life. Totally. So, so if, if growth, if company growth was a delicious meal, uh, 
what ingredients are going into that other than strong leadership committee from your experience? Like what are some of the critical ingredients that need to go into, uh, you know, the creation of, of growth? Uh, yeah, I think process, like 100%, there needs to be process. It can, you can't be running amok just trying to figure it out. You can get so far, I think, in doing that. Um, but really trying to adopt um, processes along the way, um, I think is critical. And, you know, we messed around a lot. Like you have to kind of figure out what works for your culture as well. And we never wanted to create a culture of like a bunch of lawyers that had to sit there and time track and basically hang up calls with our clients because we've gone five minutes over. Right. So, you know, we had to really look at our values and have strong values um, and build our processes around those values. Um, so I think that was a big game changer. Obviously I've alluded to the leadership um, piece and um, I think like just from a, a like a, a mindset standpoint, I think that just like pure grit and determination, like there's no shortcut, mm -hmm. right? And so Did, do you think younger Sheena thought there was a shortcut? Would you need to tell her that or was that wired uh, into you? I don't necessarily think I thought there was a shortcut where I got frustrated. And I think where most service providers, I think could say they get frustrated is that you, you almost like build up this momentum and you see success, whatever that is to you. Mm -hmm. individually. you see success right around the corner all the time. And then right. it's almost like there's a sharp right turn that kind yeah. of gets in your way that moves you away from that. And you keep going through this maze of sharp corners. Right. And it's, um, it can be really, it can be tough, right. It can be mm -hmm. tough to keep a really positive mindset. Right. But at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's just, you got to just, I think be very purposeful in what you're yeah. doing it for. Yeah. Right. And yeah. With with your guys' client with your guys' client book over the years, um, I'd imagine a big big chunk of um, you know your new client acquisition came because of the the great words of others, right? You guys did great work, and, and they became your biggest advocates. So outside of advocacy, was there any specific marketing tactics that you guys leveraged to get the right types of clients into the in somewhere in the hopper, whether that be much further downstream or or a pretty pretty warm client? Yeah, we've never marketed Anstis really ever. I think just this last year was like, it was actually part of our, our strategy. Like we put together a big business strategy and then COVID hit <laughs> and that all got freaking blown up to shreds. But the one thing that I did double down on during that time was I stuck to our plan around like trying to get more profile for the agency because we never really have in the past. And we were also, what I learned, a lot of people were still thinking about us and talking about us um, in the ways that reflected who we are 10 years ago. Mm. So we weren't talking enough about the work that we were doing now that was quite different. So people were still saying, oh, there's a PR firm or, you know what I mean? So it was something that I kind of had to invest in, which was great. So, um, that actually did pay off, um, for sure. And we were, it wasn't like we were running ads. Um, the stuff that we were doing was, um, like we did a lot of sort of surveying, we took all the tools and all of the things that we do in our agency. And we just like created content, right. um, that very targeted and very topical, um, to try to get some attention and use that to boost our credibility. Um, I would say our primary source of clientele has been through word of mouth, but network. Mm. Like I'm a networker. I'm out there all the time meeting people and, you know, ask my senior leadership team, what's been the hardest for, I think the hardest for me during COVID is that I don't have that anymore. Right. So I'm stuck behind a screen and stuck behind like in our homes and net and business development is networking. That's right. you know, like, that's what right. it is. It's relationship building. And it's been tough because you can't fill that pipeline right now. Yeah. And the world's changed. Right. So, um, that, to your point before where we have, other strategic leaders in our, in our same room together and we can put our heads together is critical. Um, doing this by yourself right now, <sighs> find somebody, uh, you know, whether it's, uh, through a network or a group or something like that, that's crazy. So, um, yeah. actually I'm going to get a little bit off track here. Somebody, <laughs> I was talking to, uh, my younger brother the other day and we we're talking about, you know, life when we were growing up, you know, pre, 
pre cell phone, pre all this stuff. And I was making a comment about, I was like, you know, like on this part on Degrassi and no idea what Degrassi was. And I was like, okay, hold on a second. So we started going down the, the, the rabbit hole of all of the things that we love so much that are no longer relevant. So let's take a little bit of a, um, nostalgic to or what from pop culture music video because i the reason i bring this up to you is because both you and your sister always it's quite hilarious how you know engaged you are in some of these like nostalgic moments and but did you weave it into your today life so what do you miss the most what do you wish came back oh man um oh that's a really good question um i really miss honestly like i miss the boundaries that were created when you didn't have a device. Like, I know that sounds kind of crazy, but this always on is really difficult, right? It's really challenging for everybody. As the ding goes. <laughs> yeah. Right. There we go. <laughs> so it's, um, I, I kind of miss the days. Like I remember when I first started out, email was just a thing. Like it just started. And like, I remember my one of my first bosses was like trying to coach me on how to use email, but I was faxing press releases and mm. I was, you know, like filing them away in traditional filing systems and writing notes on file cabinets. And like, it was, you know, so different. Like we never used the internet at yeah. all really for what we did at that time. And there was kind of a beauty in that in some respect, because you could actually pick up the phone. You knew what time reporters were in the, at their desks um, you know, you knew you could set up meetings with your client, usually in person, and you would have to get on a plane and go see them. And there was, obviously it wasn't as efficient, mm. but yeah. I kind of enjoyed that time where you kind of had some boundaries and you could leave the office and your office phone yeah. was at your office. Yeah. Right. And now it's so hard to separate. And I have clients now, and even like in my tech startup, like actually what's really interesting in my tech startup is that no one, none of the VCs want to communicate on email. They all want to communicate on WhatsApp. Hmm. They're dinging you all times of the day. You're sending files and documents to them through WhatsApp. And it's like just, you know, it's a whole other level, right? Hmm. Of communication. So I'm, you know, trying to figure out a way to set boundaries that way but i do miss degrassi degrassi was good i'm loving the 90s style that's come back yeah yeah yeah. the 90s were good was good yeah i mean to your point about the the separation and the balance i I made a commitment to um you know when i get home i'm fascinated right as i have one daughter so obviously uh, i'm learning things for the very new very first time, right? I'm just fascinated about the the evolution over 24 hours. And so I've committed to like, when I get home, I, sometimes I don't even bring my phone home, but when I get home, I just like, it's gone, it's away. And it's just like, it's freeing. So good for you. I need to get better at that. I've actually gotten worse at it through COVID. Yeah. You just have to give less shits overall. And then, and that will, uh, then you can turn exactly, it off. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So this is, uh, this is my last question. And, um, you know, businesses that achieve growth, whatever that growth looks like, good, sustainable, solid uh, growth, oftentimes have good and great leaders at the helm. Um, but when you look at a good and great leader, typically they have very specific and strong routines. Are you a woman of routine? And if so, what is yours? Yes, I'm definitely a woman of routine and I kind of have to be now with children. Like, yeah. Um, My routine is like, I'm up very early with my kids. And so I have like a small period of time in the morning to have some quiet time. But I, the first thing I do is go to the gym. So like I have a cup of coffee and I go straight to the gym and I knock out a workout because it's my time. And my days get so busy. Otherwise I I won't do it. So it's kind of like my therapy in some ways, like to kind of, what are you doing for workouts? Um, I work out with a trainer a few times a week. So we do like, I'm doing a lot of lifting actually like weightlifting and I love it. It's totally changed my body. I absolutely love it. And I feel strong and I feel great. Um, I can't do the, like, let's do a thousand, five pounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I can't do that. It just, yeah, it would aggravate me. I'm too impatient. Right. Um, so I've been doing a lot of that. And then, um, it's pretty much straight to work from there. Like I go straight into my computer 
I eat lunch at my computer. I do everything right now at my computer. Um, and then when the kids come home from school, it's usually like me trying to like get around them a bit. Mm. We're lucky because we have a lot of help, which is great. Yeah. Um, but our sort of private time is dinner. Like we have dinner as a family. We sit down every night at the table. We talk about our day. Hmm. Um, I lay down with my kids at night and talk to them about their day. They can ask me questions. Um, it's sort of like that real, um, yeah, the sort of private time, right? You yeah. get a lot of it when you're an entrepreneur. So you got to kind of make the best of what you have. Yeah. And then my husband and I always every night sit down, we have the TV, put a fire on, have a glass of wine and talk about our day yeah. and just kind of reconnect. So important. I, usually I watch smut TV for about half an hour. No word of a lie. What are you watching? I watch the worst you can watch. I watch Don't Be Tardy for the Party. I watch yeah. Real Housewives. I watch Bachelor. The, the smuttiest. Oh, no, The Bachelor is way too high. Like, oh, okay. All right. I, mean, I need like the gross social. Yeah. So I just zone out on that and then bed and start it all over again. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, so where uh, I know that your new venture is is kind of uh, kind of top secret right now, um, but you know where do you want? Actually, on your guys' uh, on your point about uh, content that Anstice is putting out, what I've noticed about Anstice's content is that there's no fluff to it. Um, it is it is very well researched. I know Mark does a great job on a lot of the stuff. I follow Mark uh, very closely. Um, you know, where, where, where do you want to point us, uh, the listeners in terms of where should we follow along? What should we be looking at? Anything specifically you want us to engage with? Yeah. I mean, I think our Instagram account is probably the most up to speed or our LinkedIn account is the most up to speed on sort of what we're doing and what we're thinking. Um, I'm really trying to become more of a voice in fighting for the customer and it's funny, like I work with a lot of, I have actually a lot of international people that are surrounding me on my team, both at Ari and Anstis. And we're so far behind in Canada as it relates to data and how we're using data and how we're actually interacting with that data as it relates to our customer data. So um, we're really trying to kind of advocate right now and educate companies more along the lines of, guess what? You can you can measure ROI in marketing. Mm. You can actually use data and commercialize it. Like you can optimize it. There's, and it's just mind blowing to me how many companies don't do that right now. Mm -hmm. So we're really trying to stand for that um, and help companies um, kind of do things a bit differently right now that is maybe going to save them some time and money down the road. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's an interesting world that we're in. People are, in some ways more open-minded than they've ever been before. Um, but then you have the other end of the spectrum where people are like far more fearful than ever before too. So it's, uh, it's going to be interesting to see how this all plays totally. out. Well, thank you so much. I, I know it's your, your, your schedule is crazy these days, but thank you so much. I've always, uh, always looked up to you and considered you to be a role model and a mentor in this crazy world of agency life so you're not doing so bad yourself my friend i appreciate it it's empty it's it's sad right now it's an empty office we we literally just like three days ago we had a big like all right everyone's coming back you know like we got to get the band back together and people come in we set up the christmas tree and then oh, so i can't work it i can't personally work at home it's just I, I can't do it it doesn't fit with my my routine but uh no i you need people so thank you sheena I appreciate it. Thank you.